welcome to Franklin Covey's On Leadership Series. My name is Scott Miller, and I'm honored to serve as your ongoing host and interviewer. Today is a special day. We have the Emmy Award-winning TV producer, real estate mogul, best-selling author, advisor, coach, teacher, really this contagiously inspiring friend to many of us, Nellie Galan. Nellie, welcome to On Leadership. Scott, it's so great to be here with you and so happy to share this moment and talk to all the entrepreneurs out there and, and talk about our journeys. You know, I feel like we're friends now because we had you as a guest on our iHeart radio program, Great Life, Great Career, where you were a force of nature. So I'm excited to have you back today and have some similar discussions around what does it mean to be self-made in 2018 and how can you inspire us through some of your successes but what I love most about you is the inspiration you teach through so many of your failures. That's right. I think, you know, I think uh, one of the things I wish I had known earlier in my life is that your relationship with fear and failure is everything in life. And, you know, not only is it a relationship, it's like they, fear and failure has to become your best friend because fear shows up every day of our lives. And, you know, I think people don't realize that you can rewire your feelings around it. Like when it shows up, you want to just split. You want to go, no, I'm not doing this. And instead you have to do contrary action. You have to say, do it anyway, do it anyway, do it anyway. Because if you do nothing, guaranteed nothing will happen. And if you try and do something, maybe it won't work, but at least you have a 50-50 shot. So fear is very essential and failure, you know, people always say, this is what you've done. You know, we all promote what we do and we all hype up our successes. But in fact, maybe we should be hyping up our failures because in my case, to have two or three major successes in my life, I've had to have thousands of failures. So I think of it a lot like my stepson who is a skateboarder. If he doesn't fall a lot, he's not winning medals. You have to fall a lot to succeed one or two or three times. So for me, what I say to myself when I fail, and now I'm just very comfortable failing, it's like, I'm assuming I'm gonna fail more than I'm going to succeed. When I fail, I tell myself, okay, cry it out, mourn it. And then I go, get back on the horse, get back on the horse, get back on the horse. Because around the corner from your greatest failures, inevitably are your greatest successes. And I think the people that are more bitter in life and that feel like, life didn't work out, it's because they don't stay in the game. You have to be in the game every day and not give up. So you have to get back on the horse. And when you're afraid, you have to do it anyway. Nelly, I think one of your greatest gifts to us is your authenticity and your transparency. You know, people hear this concept of overnight sensation or this overnight wonder, and you prove you've had significant fame and success. We'll talk about that. Your brand's growing bigger, but you admit readily that what got you to these a couple of big successes was this continuous stream of failure, learning, trying again. Scott, I feel like I'm a farmer. I mean, I think that's a really good metaphor for all of us. I think, you know, you get up every day, you plow the fields, you know, and you don't have success. Like once, once in a blue moon, the crop comes up and you can say hurrah for three days and then you just have to go back and do the same thing all over again. There is no quick fix. There is no instant success. When you see someone that is instantly successful, you all of a sudden find out about me and you go, wow, this girl's everywhere. But you know what? I've been at it for 20, 30 years, you know, with discipline, with like, it's like a meditative practice where you just get up every day, every year you, you say, what are the three things I'm going to accomplish this year? Not 50 things or you do nothing. Break it down. What are the three things I'm going to do this month to accomplish those three things in the year? What are the three things I'm going to do this week? What are the three things I'm going to do this today? And just like that, like a turtle, little step by step, all of a sudden when you least expect it, it all comes together and it looks to the rest of the world like an instant success or a miracle but it's really like a practice, a very disciplined practice. Nelly, your, uh, your fame and your brand, as I mentioned earlier, is growing every day right now. You speak around the world keynoting um, at, on your websites. You have a series of webinars and, and tutorials for people. We'll get to those in a moment. I'm fascinated with your journey. Would you take a couple of minutes and kind of walk people through who are still kind of learning who you are and what you're about? Walk us through your journey kind of in your personal life and a bit of your career. 
Well, I think the most important thing people need to know about me is that I'm an immigrant. I came to this country when I was five years old from Cuba. We had just gone through a communist revolution. My parents who were in their 30s and already very successful from one day to the next lost everything. The banking system collapsed and the government changed and the, the money changed. So we had to come here with the clothes on our back and start all over again. And I think that's important because I think in America, you know, the narrative of the history of America is very black and white. We talk about African-American history and we talk about American history and where, where Americans come from, but we don't always talk about where all the other immigrants come from. And I don't think people realize that when people come here, you know, they come from places where horrible things have happened. And when they come here, they're so grateful. My parents taught me to love this country, to love the military, to be a, a patriot, to, to be engaged in this country. And they worked really hard all over again. They had to start from scratch. And so to see my parents make the sacrifices that they made so that I could have everything, so that I could be self-made, which is something I don't think people realize in most countries of, of the world, no matter how, how intelligent you are, you're not going to rise above your class and in one generation have the ability to become self-made and wealthy. Only this country offers that. So for me, just that, that whole background really is what set the tone for me. In the seventh grade, um, I was, you know, 12 years old. My parents had sent me to all-girl Catholic school because they thought I was a good student. And I think my, my big thing that happened to me that changed my life is I'd overhear my parents at night, like a lot of kids of parents that are immigrants, we're empaths and we're empathetic because we've had parents who have suffered. And so I'd overhear them say, we can't afford the school. And my mother would say, what are we going to do? And my father would say, don't worry, Jesus will help us. And I was like, oh my God, the nuns, are they're gonna want their money. And I had heard a lady down the street who was selling Avon and she'd always say to me, honey, why don't you sell some Avon and I'll give you from some free lipstick. And like a good starting entrepreneur, I'm like, I got to cut a better deal than that. And so I went to see the lady and I said, listen, I'll sell Avon, but it's got to be 50, 50. I had seen that on a TV show <laughs> and she's like, okay. And the first week I sold Avon, I made 200 bucks. You know, entrepreneurs are scrappy people. We've got that gene. And after a month I had made $800 and I started paying down my tuition. And then I worried that it was going to really hurt my father, that he was gonna be ashamed that he couldn't pay for his daughter. So I went to the head nun and I said, please send a letter home and say that I got a scholarship, make something up. I bring the letter home and I show it to my mom. And she goes, she says, what does it say? My parents didn't speak English very well. What does it say? And she hands it to my father and he goes, Oh my God, your daughter is a genius and Jesus helped us after all. <laughs> and, you know, that is the marker um, moment of my life because I realized I can always solve a problem. I have it in me to figure it out. And from there, you know, I kept going and I kept going. And I think, you know, I got into the television because um, at a very young age, I had gotten this internship at Seventeen Magazine and I wrote articles. And I got recruited to this teen TV show and I did all that. And I was really like, like any teenager excited, like I'm going to go be a network correspondent someday. And I had another magical thing happen, which is I was sent all over the country. I ended up working for CBS. I was like 21 years old by this point. And I was a stringer. I'd go interview people. And I interviewed a man by the name of Norman Lear. And he said to me, oh my God, are you Latina? He goes, my partner and I just brought the first Spanish TV station in America. And he's like, we should hire you. And you know, you're a Latina and this and that. And I said, I thought to myself, is he crazy? Why would I want to go work on a Spanish TV station? Ugh. Like when I'm going to be a network correspondent at CBS. And I think a lot of us have those ego moments. And he said to me, young lady, are you rich? And I said, no. And I said, well, I'm rich. And he goes, do you not understand that the Latino market is going to be a multi-billion dollar market? And that if you're employee one of the first Spanish TV station, you're going to end up a very rich woman. And I think in that moment, I always wonder, would my son have made that decision who's had a much easier life? Or would he have gone with his ego? I, because I had parents that were poor, 
that didn't have money because I was an immigrant, I thought in that moment, this guy sounds smarter than me to me. And I'm going to quit the glamorous job and I'm going to go be employee one of what is now Telemundo, which was the single greatest decision of my life. He was right. Imagine being today employee one of Google. Uh, what would you be worth? So I started as this employee. I behaved as if that company was mine. I acted as if I was the owner. And I think that's the key to the story is like, you can't, when you're in a job and you hate it, think I hate this job. No, this is your MBA on the job on someone else's dime. You have to every day think, would I spend my money on this? Is this a decision I would make if this was my company? If you're not thinking like that, you're not going to, you're not going to end up the way I've ended up, which is I ended up being the first Latina and the first woman president of, a te of that television network, Telemundo. And I worked inside a corporation and learned how to think entrepreneurially. So when I finally sold that company and went off on my own, I knew what to do. So I think that's a lot of my story. It's very methodical. It's very turtle-like, but it works. Nelly, I don't need to ask you any questions. I just want to hear you talk <laughs> because it's so captivating and, and real. You also did a stint on The Apprentice with then the star Donald Trump. Would you talk about kind of how that happened and what some of your resistance was and what your experience was like on that series? So I, you know, let's go back to, I, 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 you know, I ran Telemundo, we sold it and then NBC bought it and NBC asked me to become a producer for them. And I, I produced like 700 TV shows for Telemundo and for Fox and for NBC, but NBC was my number one client. And they called me one day and they said, you know, we're starting the show Celebrity Apprentice and we would really like for you to go on the show. And at first I was like, are they messing with me? Like, I said, I'm not a celebrity. And the president of NBC said, uh, why don't you just thank me for giving you millions of dollars of publicity for the company? How many times do we get offered something? And again, we get afraid or our low self-esteem comes up and we don't take the bull by the horns. You know, I always say that to be chosen, you have to choose yourself first. And so they asked me to be on it. They were my number one client. And I was like, thank you. Okay, I'll do it. But the reason they chose me is because Donald Trump was very, had a very problematic at the time relationship with Latinos, which I think has continued. And they didn't want an actress to go on the show that wasn't going to speak to Donald Trump in a professional fashion. And that could talk, you know, that could tussle with Donald Trump, that could say to him, no, you're wrong. And so I went on the show. And in the first episode, Donald Trump, like, let me have it. And I very calmly said, with all due respect, I think you're wrong and this is why. And I told him. And we stopped taping the show and he said, I like you. I like that you argue with me. I like that you, you know, question what I'm saying. And he goes, I'm going to keep you on the show because you're great. So I kept staying on the show and staying on the show. And when I came off the show, I had an offer to go speak at all the Fortune 500s because all the women, particularly women that look like me, women that are immigrants, women that are women of color, Asian women, black women, Middle Eastern women were like, who the hell is this girl? You know, how did she get there? And I realized going to all these companies and speaking the value of my story, the value that people have in knowing that if someone that looks like them could do it step by step, that it's doable, that it's possible. As I say to women and I say to men as well, I'm not J-Lo, I'm not Beyonce, I'm, an, I'm not an athlete. I think sometimes we think that, you know, these people that are one of a kind talent are the only ones that get to be self-made or get to be wealthy in their lifetime. And no, so many of us, whether you work in a corporation and you have a side hustle and you invest the money from the side hustle, and or whether you do that and work and then leave and start your own business. I'm someone who, who at 45 was able to retire if I, if I wanted to, I'm never going to retire, not just on the business that I ran and, and the businesses I've had, but on the way I invested my money in real estate, because real estate's made me five times the money than my regular businesses. All of that was, I was able to do it like a turtle, step by step, not being some grandiose person. And through my work and through my accomplishments, I got on Celebrity Apprentice and I got media and I got press and I wrote a book. 
but it comes after you do the work. You have to earn those things by being a turtle and doing the work. Millie, it's a great story. I know everybody's wondering about your relationship with President Trump. What's he like? How is he different off camera than on camera? And would you describe that? And if you could talk to him again, what advice would you give him now after he's moved from you know, reality television to the presidency of the United States? Well, I think who you see is who I'm not. And he's, he's very uh, you know, audacious. He's very bold. Uh, he's very alpha male. You know, he's very like, you know, decisive. Um, I never thought he would be the president of the country because he's lived quite a colorful life to say the least. However, I think that what I would say to him is, um, I think you can say things uh, in the world and you can be tough. And I think that, you know, business people have to be tough to get to where they're going. But I think I would say to him, you know, the number one customers in America and in the world are people of color and particularly women of color. And I think that you can say the toughest things to people without putting people down. You know, I think that the people that love this country the most, that are most committed to this country, that carry the values, the true values of this country, and that are patriotic are immigrants and people of color. So, you know, I, I wish you would ask me because that's what I would tell him to do. Nelly, let's talk about self-made. So you are renowned as a now successful entrepreneur, and you have a great vision and passion and sort of practical advice for people who are thinking about becoming entrepreneurs, having a side hustle. What are some of the key lessons you've learned around sort of, as you call it, kind of a turtle, carefully calibrating towards becoming an entrepreneur? Well, I think first of all, uh, you know, please don't leave your jobs from one day to the next. This isn't something that's irrational. This is something that is very strategic. Um, I think for me, I'm just going to tell you what I what I say, and I, I love to say this to you because I really want to give you really solid advice so that you can know what to do right now. You have to save two years of salary, um, and you're going to say to me, "Well, that's impossible. I live in New York or San Francisco." Or, it is possible, and I've done it. So you can't tell me it's not possible. You have to sacrifice in life for big things. And so the, the discipline it takes to not waste money. You know, I tell women, don't buy shoes, buy buildings. I say to men, well, you know, don't waste money on things like bars and, you know, you know, coffee every day. You have to have a vision of something great. And then you have to sacrifice to get it. So you start by saving two years of salary. One, that you're going to save and put away for an emergency. Because people that are living in survival, one paycheck away from a catastrophe are going to fail over and over again even more. You have to have money put away. And then the second year is this, the, the money that you're going to use to invest. Whether And I'm going to give you many ways to invest, either in real estate, in stock, in a side hustle, in you know going and one hour a week driving an Uber, Airbnb being a room in your house, using the shared economy. You have to have a side hustle. Let's call it a side hustle or let's call it an investment because the entire American financial system is based on people becoming wealthy by making money while you sleep. That means you cannot just make money on your main, on your main job. Even if you're a doctor, a lawyer, you work in a company, if you're a doctor and something goes wrong and you get sick or you have a car accident, you no longer make money. So if you haven't invested your money in something else, do not put all your eggs in that one basket of your work. So life is about mission and money. What do you love? And good luck, because we all can't do what we love right away. I tell all young millennials, I don't feel sorry for you if you have four jobs and you hate them all. Don't hate them all because all those jobs are part of the puzzle of your life. And you're going to know that you had those jobs for a reason. And so mission and money, you always have to be making money and you always have to be making money while you sleep. And the younger you start, the richer you're going to be. And the older you start, it's never too late, but you're going to have to really hunker down on the sacrifice. So to me, it's all about that. It's like, let's, ground ourselves, save two years of salary. That means you might have to move to a smaller apartment or get roommates, or you might have to, you know, not go out every Saturday night and go out to eat. 
You have to sacrifice to reap the benefits later in life. You have to. Nelly, in your book, Self Made, and you talk a lot about this idea of being an entrepreneur and how important it is, and you give steps on how to fail less, but you also confront the fact that not everyone should become an entrepreneur. And you, I heard coined this phrase, I've heard it from you more than anybody else, around being an entrepreneur, around mm -hmm. people who maybe want to stay in their corporate jobs and how to find fulfillment. Talk about that concept and how can people who would maybe be better off becoming an entrepreneur thrive in their organizations? So entrepreneurs, first of all, have to have very big egos because you have to really believe in yourself and love yourself more than anyone to believe you can do it. That's not everyone's personality type. I think also entrepreneurs tend to be people that you know really, really, really um, can take risks, have a stomach for taking risks. That's not for everybody. Um, sometimes I think there's many other options that people don't realize. First of all, you can work in a corporation, hopefully be, be in a corporation early, find an emerging market and emerging business don't go into businesses that are going down go into businesses where you go in and there's only seven employees and there's going to be three thousand of them in three in three years and you get stock that is a side hustle getting the stock isn't it invest i entrepreneurship you can be someone that aligns with an entrepreneur you can be the number two of an entrepreneur or the number three or the number ten and work for them and get stock and be on the bottom floor and then be an entrepreneur association. You're not the founder, which takes a certain personality type, but you are in the team of entrepreneurship. And then I think there's also other ways to be entrepreneurial, which is just go get a job and spend a lot of your extracurricular time investing your money, which is what I did. I went and bought buildings. I took, I, I started with $5,000. You know, you hear Donald Trump say a lot that in America, he didn't pay that much tax because he used the tax laws. The truth is all of us can pay less tax if we pay attention to the tax laws and invest the money in things where there are tax incentives. It's like a tax incentives are like coupons that come back to you and you save money. So I took $5,000, I bought my first building, I flipped it. And I used a tax law called the 1031 exchange, which means you can take the earnings of that building, reinvest them in another building and not pay tax. You avoid the tax, you keep pushing it forward and pushing it forward. And from that $5,000, from the time I was 31, my first building, I bought little tiny thing, $5,000 by the time I was 45, I had 16 buildings and the revenue from those buildings made more money more cash flow than my business. It's doable. Nelly, let's switch to the topic of leadership. You know, you are a business owner. You've been a leader of Telemundo and other, other corporations. You've worked for leaders. When you think about what makes a great leader, what, what, what concepts, practices, behaviors come to mind for you? I think a great leader is like a great for a lot of people that are very successful and have made a lot of money, but that doesn't mean they're great leaders. Leadership is a whole other thing that it's kind of like, really, it's really what kind of person do you want to be? And I think the honest truth of that is great leadership is leading by example. You can't ask people to do things that you're not willing to do. You can't, you know, I've, I've had like a couple of millennials come and work for me in the last couple of years in a new startup in, in this whole business that I'm doing with women. And they've come to work with me and they go, oh, you, I have to build shelves? That's not my job title. I go, you have to clean the toilet if I tell you. I said, guess what? I clean the toilet and I go to the White House. And I think great leadership is leading by example and being congruent that what you say you're about, you actually walk the walk of that every day. And it is very difficult. And I have to tell you, many successful people fail at leadership because they're, they're stressed out and they're not really willing to really every day say, what is it that I'm doing? What is my intention? Besides growth, we all wanna grow. I mean, growth should be all of our intention. Making more money for a company or for ourselves should be our intention. But on top of that, we have to have a higher purpose. And that means we almost have to love that business 
and those people that work for us almost more than ourselves, just like we love our children more than ourselves, and really be into the culture of that company. You know, Nellie, in case anybody's confused, um, I'm getting to know you fairly well, and you aren't all about the money. You no. really are about what money can do for you in terms of your empowerment and being self-made and control. Talk a bit about the, the end mind of, of, of what that focus since your 30s has done and given you opportunities now to pursue your passions. I mean, you're, you're accomplishing perhaps more now than you ever have in your life. I mean, talk a bit about what's going on in terms of your education, future books you're writing. Talk about the yeah. path that, that money has provided yeah. you in the future years of your life. So I think, you know, I wrote in the book, Come Empower, self and Rich in Every Way. And that's very important. And I think specifically for someone with my background, because I come from a culture, uh, being a Latina, where money isn't everything at all, where you need to be rich in family, rich in your spiritual life, rich in love, in all of these other ways. Because if you're rich and you don't have the other stuff, like it kind of doesn't count. You know, I believe, you know, that love is everything. So just to have money, I promise you, and we all know these people, beyond wealthy people, I've worked for seven billionaires in my life. They haven't all been happy. They haven't all been rich in other ways. So sometimes, you know, it, it, you have to realize that balance is also something. Um, it's important to make money and to focus on that as soon as you can, because when you're younger and you have life force, you can get there faster. And it's something you almost have to check off the box because it gives you options. Money doesn't make you happy, but it gives you many options. Sometimes I've noticed that people that have too much money, like they cross the line of too much money, then the money becomes a burden. Then you wonder if people really like you for you. Then you wonder if, you know, who's working for you? Are they stealing from you? I've seen that with people that are billionaires. So I aspire to have enough money to not worry about money. And the choices it, it has given me are what has given me a whole other like lease on life. I mean, I never finished school when I was young, partially because I got into TV early, but partially because I also took care of my parents. And go back to school on my own dime. I was able to show my son, who was eight years old at the time, who didn't like school. He said, mom, why do I have to go to college? You never finished school and you've done well. And I said, I don't ever want to hear you say that. I want college to be a choice. Not everyone needs to go to college and maybe it's not for you, but I don't want you to see that your mother didn't give you that choice and didn't give you that example. So I went back to school at 45. I paid for my own school, which I love because I appreciate it so much. And I got a master's and doctorate in clinical psychology. I didn't go to business school because I felt like I learned business on the job. I wanted to understand human behavior because all of business is human behavior and customer service and dealing with human beings in the way they think. And I think I would not be here today if I didn't take four years off to a six year program in four years and really have the time to think bigger, to think has what's gotten me to today still working for me or do I need to take a quantum leap and think bigger. And that's why I'm here today. Nellie, your story is so inspiring. It's real, it's also relatable. In our last couple of minutes, I'd love to talk about kind of what's next on the horizon for you, because you have your hands in a lot of different projects. You've coined this phrase, you know, don't buy shoes, buy buildings. Talk a bit about the next book that you're writing and, and kind of what the, the, the premise behind that is. Well, the, the chapter of my book that people really responded to the most specifically women, was don't buy shoes, buy buildings. Because I think nobody tells you, uh, specifically as a woman, that you're buying all these shoes, I mean, just to be literal for a moment, and they're in your closet, and they're not going to help you when you're retiring. And I think the book, the, the title, Don't Buy Shoes, Buy Buildings, is a metaphor for investing. The book is about investing to become self-made. Uh, and all the different opportunities that exist in this country to invest in, in this moment. It's so exciting in a digital age. And how do you just put a little money aside and have it grow exponentially? And the quicker you do it, the quicker, quicker it'll grow. 
Um, and in ways that we forgot, we forgot that there's so many franchises in America. You don't have to invent a business from scratch, invest in a franchise. Um, go to the little local business in your neighborhood that the old man is retiring from and his kids don't want to run it and buy a business with existing revenue. We forgot about that. We forgot that in a digital age, you can be an expert in something and blog about it and monetize your online voice or put your kids to do it. I feel like this is a family thing. Becoming self-made is a journey for your entire family and you need to model the behavior so your kids turn out right and they're not entitled kids that don't want to work and that are lazy and that don't don't become people that are grateful and that are empathetic and people that understand what it needs, means to meet payroll or what it means to invest in something and lose money and get back on the horse and do it again. Those are all lessons in life crucial to all of us. Nellie, in our final minutes here, I want to talk about your, um, your kind of the nature of your giving back. You spend as much time building businesses as you do coaching, inspiring, and helping people lift themselves and their families. You have launched a new free webcast series that teaches some great concepts to people at you know, self, uh, becomingselfmade.com. Talk a bit about that self-made series and why someone would be interested in joining that. I think, that, by the way, and I tell all young people that say to me, I want to start a nonprofit. I go, no, you can start a nonprofit when you're rich. Go make money first, and later on you can give back. I'm in the stage of life where I can give back. But that's because I'm already, I already put the oxygen mask on myself and took care of myself and my family first. I am very devoted to giving my information away because I believe that when you do work and you learn things, when you give it to someone else, you know, your work becomes transcendent. It becomes your mission. It really has made me happier than all the work I've ever done before. And so I don't want you all to listen to me. Like I, in the past, have listened to inspirational people and I get excited. And then I turn this monitor off and I say, well, how do I do this now? What do I do? So I've given you, uh, and I, I have an entire site with free webinars where I break everything down step by step. Like all those questions that you go, this is, a, I, I can't ask that question. It might be a dumb question. I've asked them for you and I'll answer them for you. So there is this webinar series that I want to give to you as a gift. It's called becomingselfmade.com forward slash mastery. What's the rest of it, Scott? Um, underscore FC. So becomingselfmade.com forward slash mastery underscore FC. F is in Frank, C is in Cap. Right. Um, I did a three-part webinar series for you. Like if you know nothing, zero, you start watching, and it's part one, how to get started, part two, how to start a business, part three, how to make your business make money, and it breaks it down in turtle steps. And I want you to take that because you can watch it on your own leisure, in your pajamas, and really feel grounded in this work that you can do this. You can do this. I did it. Again, I remind you, I'm not a singer. I'm not a celebrity. I'm not an athlete. I'm just a normal person that worked their way up step by step. And I am self-made. To that point, self-made is a great read. I've had Nelly on, I guess I mentioned both on our uh, radio program, iHeartRadio, Great Life, Great Career. She's here today. We hope to invite you back. When your next book comes out, perhaps next year, Nellie, thank you for your time. I encourage everybody to visit the website we mentioned. And for those of you that are listening to this in podcast format, in the podcast notes, we'll be sure to repeat the address to Nellie's complimentary webinar series on becoming self-made. Nellie, you are a force of nature. You're super abundant. You're just a great friend to people. I really want to honor you for all the time that you've spent building an empire, but more importantly, teaching everybody to learn from all the mistakes that you made as well. It's a great gift to everybody, your humility and your transparency. Thank you for joining us on Leadership. Thank you so much. And I just want everyone to know that there is abundance in the world and that it's okay that, you know, don't feel like you can't give it away. There's more there. And I just want to leave you with my favorite word in Spanish, adelante, because adelante means let's move our butts, let's go, let's do it now. Take action. Nelly, I think I love you. I'm in love with my wife, but I think I love you. <laughs>
Thanks for having thanks for having us in your home in California and for joining us today on leadership and thanks to all of you for joining us. As always, this newsletter comes out on Tuesdays via email. Subscribe at franklincovey.com and it's also available on all of your favorite podcast channels and we'll see you back here next week on leadership with a new guest. Thanks for joining us and Nelly, thank you so much.